Uh, my name is Paul Chaffers. I'm the Technical Events Manager at Napier and joining me today is Richard Townsend, who is our uh, publication's technical editor. Are you on the line there, Rich? Yeah, yeah, ready to go, mate. Oh, great stuff. We always do that little check just to see that um, that we've got communications flowing OK. OK, so let's start. Fundamental principles, protection for safety. Now, when designing electrical uh, systems, the safety of persons, livestock and property is essential and the designer must consider all risks of danger that could arise in the electrical installation. So first of all, who is the designer? Now, on larger sites or larger companies, there probably is a designated designer. But for many of you guys, you do the design work, you do the construction and you do the testing and inspection. So if you're signing that on the test certificate, the designer is you. So hopefully you'll find this useful. Now, as we go through this presentation, I'm going to be talking a little bit about the um, level four designers qualification, the sitting guilds 2396 that we teach at NAPIT. Um, and I'm going to be sort of giving you some ideas on how you could approach that if you are interested. Um, it certainly sharpened my pencil when I've done it a few years ago. And I think Richard done a previous one a few years before that. So it's a, it's a good qualification to have and hopefully as we go through, I'll be able to shed some light onto that. OK, so next up. Chapter 13 provides the following conditions that could uh, a risk of injury may result from. OK, shock currents, excessive temperatures, ignition of potentially explosive atmosphere, under voltage, over voltage, electromagnetic disturbances, mechanical movement of any electrically actuated equipment, and interruption of power supplies and or safety services. Also, arcing and burning. So you need to take all of that into consideration when you're looking at your designs. OK, so you're responsible for ensuring that all aspects of the design are correct. So you're going to look at all of those fundamental principles and all of those uh, bits and pieces and make sure that you do a design that is fit for purpose. Now, when you're designing for new installations, they're often easier than refurbishments, OK? You can um, often you'll know what the intention of the building use is going to be for. You're going to know what type of clients are going to be in there, what kind of um, external influences are going to be present, and you're going to know what type of loads are in there so that you can design the equipment to suit and make it sure that it's fit for purpose. Um, all the equipment's compatible because you're designing all those bits to work together. Alterations and additions to existing systems are more of a challenge for a designer. Often the original details and designs are missing um, and there's always a desire to use as much of the existing as possible. Um, so you may be brought into, let's say, an old factory that's no longer being used as a factory and they want to convert it to, let's say, a boys um, club or a scout hut. You're going to look at the building and you're going to say, well, I expect that the um, supplies are going to be adequate because of the, the use. You're going to be thinking, well, what type of clients are in here? OK, well, we're going to have children in here, so I need to bear that in mind. They're going to be doing ball games. Well, the factory has got um, metal containment chunking, so that can stay. We might have to decomm decommission some equipment, so we may need to adjust star phase loadings and things like that. But this is the kind of work that as designers, we need to be able to understand. And it all starts off with making a assessment of general characteristics. So I'm going to bring Richard in now, who's just going to talk to you about assessment of general characteristics. Before we even consider what kind of circuit we've got, what kind of load we've got, we've got to look at general characteristics. And my general characteristics, uh, chapter 30 says, um, the insulation characteristics should be considered. A few of them are, so uh, what's the insulation going to be used for? We need to know what the insulation is going to be used for. Some people and some of you guys are going to be designing for a building that's probably not even been built. It could be commercial, it could be industrial. So we need to know what kind of general structure it's going to be, what supplies are going to be in, what are we going to have a TT, a TNCS, PME, we're going to have an IT supply, is it going to be a data centre, is it going to be any of these things? We have to look at any external influences. Where's it going to be? What's it going to be subjected to? Who's going to use it? How are they going to use it? How often are they going to use it? Compatibility of any of the equipment we use. So we need to make sure that the equipment we put in there doesn't affect any of the other stuff. Are there any issues with electromagnetic issues or any kind of influences there that could damage or, 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 or alter the ability of another piece of equipment to work properly? We need to look at CDM. How maintainable is it? Can we repair it? 
can we get up to do general maintenance? Do we need auxiliary systems in place? So we've got a really uh, important safety service that can't ever be knocked off. Do we have to have a, a second circuit or a second service that we can switch to an auxiliary while we repair the main or do some maintenance on the main? So all of these things the designer's got to think about. All the recognised safety services. So different parts of the um, sort of the consumer marketplace will have different requirements for different safety services. So a safety services in one might not be useful for another or might not be needed in another. So we've got to recognise all the different safety services, what the types are, what level they're going to be, what category they're going to be, how they're going to be installed. Now we're going to knit those into our future design. We've got to assess for a continuity of service. So does the power need to stay on all the time? Do certain areas of our installation have to stay on certain times? How long does that power need to stay on? Can we manage that with a UPS? How big is the UPS going to need to be? What sort of loading will be on that UPS? What sort of things is, do we need more than one? Do we need two? Do we need to have a standby generator? Are we going to use some kind of battery backup and storage system from a solar array uh, to give us our continuity of service so it could be seen to be more ecologically sound? So assessment of general, general characteristics, it's massive now. With the part eights that um, 7671, uh, albeit an appendix, we've got to look at efficiency also. So if we just let Paul nip over onto the next slide. Okay, so once we've done the general characteristics, we've got to look at uh, the kind of things um, that we might need that could be uh, electrical, more in our ballpark sort of thing. So we need to know where our load centres are going to be. So where are our distribution boards going to be? We're going to have one at the front. We're going to move them around and have two or three throughout our, in, our installation. If it's going to be a big in-store or a big um, commercial industrial site, What's the maximum demand of any of the systems and any standby systems? Because it's all having a main and then a standby because at some point you need to have both systems up and running before you can knock the other one off. So that means you've got twice the load suddenly appearing uh, before you knock one off. And that system's got to be able to be designed to take that extra load. Uh, what's the distribution system going to look like? What sort of protective devices are we going to use? Wiring systems, what type of cable are we going to use? I'm going to use armour. Uh, some scenarios require the use of uh, MICC, some require conduits, trunkings, cable trays, do I need to use soft skin fire cables, all of these things. Am I going to have data cables that I've got to keep separate? We've got to think about these things before we even get started. Uh, and when we get to types of protective devices, what's going to go at the front end? We're going to be thinking about um, uh, MCCBs, AC, ACCBs, all of these things. So this is kind of the stuff we're going to be thinking about before we even get to put paper on pen. Uh, and I'll just ask over to Paul now, and he's going to go through load centres and distribution blocks diagrams, the kind of things that you should be doing early on in a design. OK, thanks, Richard. Yeah, so I mentioned that um, I went through the process of sitting on the uh, designers uh, course some years ago and what it was basically is the project was for a petrol station that so it was all the forecourt the car wash the electric vehicle charging points um compressor air tire all those things then you had the canopy lighting you had the uh, supplies to the pumps and then on the inside of the building there was a staff room, there was a shop and there was a restaurant. So it was a fair size um, design to go through. And the sitting guilds, they split it up into two, two or three different tasks. Um, I think it's A, B and C. And then they're broken down to individual tasks within those. So they tell you what they want you to do. Um, and they're asking you, so all the things like Richard said, they say design and show all your justifications for using a certain wiring type. Now, if I do it and I think, well, I want to use cable tray and I'm going to use soft skin cables because I've done an assessment for this, this and this and I'm OK. It's like commercial, so I'm happy with with that. As long as you put all your justifications on the design, then you're not um, you're not wrong. Richard may look at it, he may say, well, I'm not doing that. I'm going to use um, metal containment and I'm going to use single conductors inside there. As long as he does all of his um, trunking factors correctly and puts all of his um, different pieces on the um, design, 
the examiner can see that he's made the right justifications for his design. So this shows you that there's more than one way to skin a cat. And it's down to the designer to be able to make the correct assumptions and the correct designs. But the project is quite daunting because you think, well, where do I start? So you may think, well, my drawing shows me all of the loads I've got in my kitchen. So I'll start designing my kitchen circuits. OK, straight away, unless you know the resistance um, and the volt drop of the distribution cable to the kitchen area, you can't do those calculations. So I found the best way was to think about where are your load centers and work out that distribution. And this is the actual um, block diagram that, that I came up with. Now, within it, I was asked to design the forecourt area, the kitchen area and the general lighting. But within the text of the exam, it, it told me what supply I had. I think it was a 400 amp supply. And it told me that there would be provisions needed to leave um, space for an outside contractor to come in and do the pump supplies and the HVAC. So I didn't have to design them or the switch gear. So the, the drawing and in the company notes, it explains that these are not designed. They're just space on the bus bar for those outside services. OK, so how did I get the ratings of these devices and the cables? Well, I started going through the process. So in order to size that correctly, um, you need to do the maximum demand for each load center. And the reason we apply um, diversity to maximum demands is we'd need massive great cables. If you looked at all the connected loads and you went, well, it's a 32 amp breaker, 32 amp breaker, 40 amp breaker, and you added it all up, you'd need massive great cables. And you guys know that. So we use diversity, OK? Now, it's up to you as a designer to choose which way of uh, diversity you apply. And you're quite often seeing guidance notes here to say, this is industry guidance, but a designer may do it a different way. And once you're qualified as a designer, it gives you more confidence to make decisions on diversity. Um, and I could bet you now if Richard done um, the same project, he would apply totally different diversity, but our end results would probably both still be OK. And that's the issue with it. It's a bit of an art to doing it. Um, and when you come on a course, the uh, tutors we have would be able to go through all the different methods and ways of doing it. You can apply diversity to a whole installation or to individual circuits, but it needs to be specific. So if you're getting industry guidance from somewhere that's giving you diversity factors for, um, let's say, a skull, that may not be a applicable in a commercial kitchen. So you need to make sure specific for what you're intended to design. OK, and you also as a designer, you need to be able to make assumptions. OK, so when you're looking at a certain area, you're you may not have all the details and you may say, well, we're designing that area and we're assuming that no flammable equipment will be stored in that area. That's just an, an example of an assumption. So, um, yeah, when you do your exam, you have to explain all your assumptions so that the person marking it can see why you've chose the certain things that you've chose. OK, enough about that. These drawings, they're not any. Um, this is my table, so they're not been through the graphic designer. So that's why they're not pretty or anything like this is actually from my project. So looking at the distribution board for the general power and lighting, I took the information off of the drawings and I started working out the loadings. And then I decided what level of diversity that I was going to apply. So I may have used industry guidance. I may have used my own. For example, on the hand dryers, on the drawing, it just showed four hand dryers, two in the in the ladies um, and two in the gents. No information. So I decided that I was going to use Dyson. I looked up the power ratings and then I decided that it was possible that only three out of the four would be working at any one time. So that was the assumption and the level of diversity that I applied. OK, from that we can work out all of our kilowatt ratings and what our amps are. OK, then what we can do is we can make a chart for the distribution board and we can look at balance in the phases. Um, you guys are probably aware that any um, you know current returns in the neutral on a free phase supply and you want to try and get your, um, you know, any out of balance current, you want to try and get your phases as balanced as you can. 
Now, as part of the project, it may ask you to calculate the neutral current, in which case you might have to learn how to map that out. Um, I remember doing it at college years ago. You got your 120 uh, degrees between phases and then you would map it out to scale what your currents were and, and, and plot what the neutral current was. I don't think I was asked to do that. So my assumption was I'll balance my phases to reduce um, my neutral currents. And I think, um, you know, that that was good enough. So once you've done that for each distribution board, you can then make a table to say what well, all throughout the installation, what well, all the phases are going to be balanced. And then you can start looking at, um, you know, your front end. OK, so once you've identified all that, you'll know the total installation KVA demand. You'll know where all your loads are. OK, as Richard alluded to earlier, you need to think about what equipment's in there. Is there any start up in rush currents? I think when I done mine, I possibly allowed for that on the car wash. Um, so I'll probably choose a type C or a D circuit breaker. So straight away, that's going to change the size of the cable in, in one foul swoop. So you need to know all of this before you start to put the pen to paper. As Richard said, you need to look at your power factors. OK, if you've got the equipment power factor, you can design it much more accurate. Otherwise, you have to use um, sort of factors to account for that. We used to use um, 1.8 as a as a factor for discharge lighting. So you would look at your discharge lighting and you would say, OK, it's, uh, you know, so many watts. I'll times that by 1.8. So you'd get this massive jump in what your load was to allow for, you know, power factor and efficiency. Obviously, if you're doing that on all your cables, you're going to have massive cables. So part of the project is to start choosing the switch gear. And that's one of the tasks. It asks you to choose all of your lighting and all of your equipment. And in doing that, you get the manufacturer's brochures and you make reference to those and you use the information for efficiency and power factor in the calculations, um, which, you know, all goes towards passing the exam basically. OK, so once you've uh, done all that, you're in a position to arrange the income and supply. Now for the project, they tell you what that is. But if you're on a, a site that's being built from scratch, the supply company may want to agree tariffs with you and what size of supply you need. So you need to work out what all your load centers are before you can have that conversation. So then finally, once you've done all of that, you're now in a position to start looking at the cable calculation. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to hand over to Richard here, who's going to start talking to you about the process of cable calculations. Hello, Richard, are you there? Uh, yeah, I have muting issues. Right, so before you even start to worry about the cable calculation, there's a few of the things we need to uh, take a look at. We need to look at supply characteristics. You see, if we're going to design a circuit and we're going to put our new installation together, it could be a standalone factory unit somewhere uh, and you could have a socket circuit. By the time it's reached its end point, it could be 70 or 80 or 100 metres from our incoming supply. Well, that's going to play havoc with our max ZS requirements from 7671. So we need to look at uh, DNOs, our supplier and go to the supplier and say, right, you're going to fit this supply to this building. What are you going to give me? And they may say, well, I will give you a transformer and we'll put the transformer here. OK, what's my uh, what's my ZE going to be? Oh, we can give you um, 0.1 at this point and 0.2 at this point, or if it's over here, you'll get 0.35 or we can put it right on your doorstep uh, and you can have uh, 0.04. Um, and you may say, well, um, I actually want control with the transformer, so I'll roll that into my price and we'll own the transformer and do the maintenance on it so that we can have it very, very close to us, almost on our doorstep, so that we can have some uh, external impedances uh, of the order 0 0.01. That's extremely important because when we start looking at switching requirements to switch the entire installation off on, uh, if it's a big installation, we may well be using uh, an ACC uh, B or an MCCB or variations of different types of those. Now, by definition, those uh, pieces of equipment will switch big loads. Uh, they'll handle big loads, um, but they require very, very small impedances um, to operate and to disconnect. So it's no good talking half an ohm when you've got an, a an air circuit breaker 
uh, an ACCB because that will require something like 0 0.001 or 0 0.01 something ridiculously low. So we need to make sure that the supply that's coming in uh, can function or, or allow our switching equipment to function correctly. So then we start looking at load characteristics. OK, how are we going to split our loads up? We need to balance our load. We need to make sure that it's all not just dumped on one phase or we haven't just got um, lots and lots of inrush currents, as Paul said, and then it all dies away or we haven't caked for that. What's the wiring system going to be? OK, we're going to put it in trunking. I'm going to put it in conduit. Putting it in conduit, I've got to think about some grouping factors and some thermal issues. Uh, is it going to be buried in the wall? Thermal issues. Uh, is it going to be clipped direct? Uh, free air, that's OK. Um, mechanical issues, forklift trucks, if it's that kind of environment. All of these things we've got to think about. What kind of cable? I mentioned earlier that certain tenders call for certain types of cable. So uh, is it an environment where we'll need to use MIC? Uh, can we get away with soft cable? Uh, as a client said, it should be in a conduit. So all of the insulation reference reference methods we've just spoken about, we've, not to, we've got to look at them again. So again, we're now getting into the territory where I've been a detailed conversation with our client because it's not very, uh, it's not an easy process to design a big installation. We've also got to kind of look at uh, volt drop constraints. OK, so from a volt drop constraint scenario, there are requirements in uh, 7671, which we'll talk about uh, a bit later on. But for now, let's just remember we'll talk about volt drop constraints later on. And also keep in mind that if we've got control of our um, transformer, we have a few trips of power sleeve to help with the design, which kind of outweighs possibly the extra cost of it. So if Paul can come forward. So if we go through a cable calculation process, look at our first three steps. We need to know what our design current is going to be for each circuit. We'll break it down by circuit. I know we've been talking about the entire installation, but now we've got to start somewhere. So we're going to look at one circuit. OK, we need to know the design current. What are we going to do? Is it a single phase circuit? OK, that's basic. Ohm's law, uh, swaps over volts, gives us our design current. No problem there. If it's a three phase system, we're going to put root three in there. Give us our three phase uh, design characteristic for a unity power factor installation. Uh, if we've got a three phase installation and we're using power factor efficiency um, uh, equipment to try and get our power factor to the most efficient economical it can be, we've got to add that in as well. We've now got to select the type and current rating of our over current protective device. So we've then got our design current. We've sort of picked our um, device because at this stage we're roughly picking things. We're not saying it will be this because it may not be. We may need to change it and that will become apparent later on. We've then got to apply uh, relevant correction factors to obtain our tabulated current. So each cable has got a tabulated uh, maximum current and that can be altered by reference methods, its ability to dissipate heat and all of the different things we put through it. Uh, things like, um, uh, there we go, Paul's popped it up. So IT, our tabulated current carrying capacity. So that's in the table we'll talk about later. Um, but we've got ambient temperature, we've got a grouping factor, thermal insulation, and a rewirable fuse. Now, that's just a few of them. There are quite a lot. And on the top there, we've got our rated current or setting of our protective device. Uh, and our tabulated current carrying capacity has to be greater than that formula there. OK, so when we break that down a little bit further, we've got a basic circuit there. We've put a 3036 fuse in there. Uh, simply because lots of commercial industrial uh, installations still use them. You can still buy them and in certain scenarios you can still install to them. So you've got to calculate a factor, a few factors in. And we've put, put in there, yeah, this is out of on-site solutions, and we've included the different factors uh, of thermal efficiency, ambient temperature, grouping factors, and our 3036. So what we've done in our formula at the top is taken the two most onerous so we've taken the two that give us the biggest uh, threat, if you like. So we look at ambient temperature and 3036 fuse to get our IT. So once we've got our IT, we can then start looking at the tables in 7671. So, um, so, sorry, sorry, Rich, to uh, slip of the tongue there, mate. We're, we're using the thermal insulation uh, factor 
point five there. Sorry, just... I was away. Yeah, sorry, I was looking at a different. <laughs> so, no. no worries, mate. No worries. No worries. There we go. Next so step. Let me use a current carrying capacity uh, of a cable. We select that from Appendix 4. So we'll just pop that up. And there we go. So if we've got, for argument's sake, uh, a requirement for 20 amps, and it's going to be uh, clip direct reference method C, uh, it's a, a one core cable, we need, say, 20 amps. We can't use, uh, oh, actually, I'll go a bit bigger. Let's say we need to use 50 amps, 60 amps for argument's sake. Uh, if we look there, if we want 60 amps, we can't use a 6 mil because that's only rated at 49 there, but we can use a 67, a 10 mil is rated at 67 and we need 60. So that's cool. That's our starting point. We can crack on with the size 10 mil because that's where we need to be. So we've got that cable now, but it's not set in stone there. We may need to alter it. We've got a few more things that we need to think about. So we've never consider voltage drop. I'm sure it's not too excessive. Now, 52502 says that voltage drop from the origin supply to the furthest point in insulation would not exceed that stage in section 6.4 of Appendix 4. And Paul's going to bring that up. And there we have it. That's not a nice long calculation there. And if he just brings up the next bit. So we're allowed 3% in lighting, 5% in other, in a, if you've got a public distribution system, or 6% and 8% if we've got a privately owned distribution system. Now, the privately owned distribution system, I asked you to remember about the uh, transformer and the owning of it earlier on. So if you own the transformer, that's a privately owned distribution system. Whether the power comes from somewhere else, you have the transformer, you own it, you control it, which means you can now vary the taps within that transformer um, for your benefit. So you can increase the voltage. I can't remember the steps offhand, but I think it's something like 243, 247, 253. The HV guys probably be up on it, but that's roughly where you see you're in a, a rural installation and you see 253 volts. That's probably because the tap and the transformer has been whacked right up um, to take into consideration voltage dips when uh, low current's taken. So you can now see the benefit of having a privately owned distribution system, take control of the transformer, uh, and that means if you need to go a long way with the power and take into consideration voltage drop, we can wind the transformer up a bit. We've also got to take into account that it's not about that. Um, we've got to look at the equipment that we use. So if you are the designer uh, and you want to deviate from the beaten path and say, well, the equipment I'm using has been confirmed by the manufacturer to operate at 3 percent is up below to 3%, which essentially gives me 6%. Well, you can do that if you're the designer because you're supposed to take account of voltage drop. You take account of voltage drop. And the manufacturer says, this equipment will work adequately here and be efficient, et cetera, et cetera, provided you've cleared that with the client. Because the client may say, well, I'm okay with that, but at a later date, I may wish to increase the type of uh, equipment that I've got, <coughs> which will require no less than 3%. So again, we're getting into a design stage where it's not straightforward. There's a lot to think about. OK, so moving on. OK, thanks, Rich. Um, yeah, just whilst we're on the voltage drop there, we uh, sort of top tip that we gave in the on-site solutions was to rearrange that formula at, um, as a good place to start. Because what I found when I started getting into cable calcs years ago is that you go through all that process of putting all your factors on, go into your, your your correct cable. Yeah, that's fine. Only for it to fall down on voltage drop. So if you rearrange the um, formula to find out what your uh, millivolt amp per meter is required, then you can go straight to the correct cable. You still got to do all the other checks, but it saves a lot of trial and error. OK, so step six of the calculation now is evaluation of shock risk. OK. So you need to make sure that your um, disconnection times can be met. So you, you're all familiar with measuring ZS, OK? And you can calculate that by the circuit length, the R1, R2, um, using the tabulated uh, resistance parameter. And we've given that in table 4.4 of the on-site solutions, um, which I'm going to show you in a minute. OK, and then you add that to your ZE. So Richard talked earlier about 
the essential part. You need that ZE to be able to do your full calculation. OK, and then you can check that against the max uh, loop impedance uh, tables in 41.2 to 41.4 of the recs. OK. Here's the table that we've got in the uh, publication, and this is in ohms per kilometer. OK, and it's at 20 degrees, so that's important things that is OK. Um, and a quick example, if you was to work out what your um, R1, R2 value is of a 20 meter twin and a half. Um, I'm sure you've all done this. You'll get 20 meters times the 2.5, which is 7.41, and add that to 20 meters of the 1.5. OK, so that gives us that. And because it's in kilometers, we need to divide it by a thousand to put it into ohms. Brilliant. So we now know what the R1, R2 is. But remember, I said it's at 20 degrees. OK, when we design, we need to um, design for what the maximum operating temperature of a cable is. OK, so when it's working under load, we need to arrange for that. So for a, a cable that's incorporated in in um, a cable, you know, the conductor is incorporated in a cable or bunched, you use a factor of 1.2 as the multiplier. So you add that, you times the R1, R2 by 1.2, OK, add it to your ZE, and then you have your design ZS, OK? Remember, at this stage, you're sitting there with scale drawings or you're on site with a drawing. There's nothing to measure. You've got to do it all by calculation, OK? So you need that design ZS to go on to your next step, OK? And you're going to be looking at, in the next step, the evaluation of thermal risks to conductors, OK? And we start with looking at the CPC. OK, so we can use the ADO back equation for size in the CPC or we can use table 54.7 in the regs for, so, uh, for sizing. Now, the ADO back equation, um, it's quite simple to go through it. S is, our, is the cable conductor size. Um, I is the fault current, OK, where the device operates at. T is the operating time of the device, so you need to be aware that's not where people say, oh, it's a distribution circuit. I've got so many seconds or it's a point four. This is the actual time that the um, device operates in. OK, and you get that from the uh, time current curvature charts in the regs. So you know your fault current. You can find out exactly when the device is going to operate. OK. Now you're probably thinking, well, how did you get your fault current? Well, remember, we've just calculated the um, design ZS. We can now use Ohm's law. We know what the voltage is. We know what the resistance is. We can work out what the current is. OK, so quite simply, it's the current squared times um, the, the time that you've got off of the curvature chart. And then it's the square root of that. So it's only the top line. It's the square root of I squared T then divided by K, which is the factor which takes into account the, uh, the conductor material and the temperature coefficients, etc. OK, if that's too much trouble, you can use um, the table out of the regs and we've represented that in the solutions uh, publication in table uh, 4.5. But what you can see is it leads to much bigger conductors, OK? So where the protective conductor and the line conductor are the same, OK, you would need the same size. OK, so where S is less or equal to a 16 mil in this column, you'd need the same size. So in many cases, you may want a 16 mil line conductor for the load. You're not necessarily going to need a 16 mil for the earth. And if you use that table for a complete installation, you wouldn't get the job because you'd be too expensive because your cables would be way oversized. So it's an OK table to use and to make reference to. But really, and truthfully, the ADO back equation from a designer's point of view is the way that you would go. Then next up, you're still looking at the thermal aspects of the cables now, but we're looking after considering the ADO back equation for our faults we need to check the cable regarding short circuit current. So if we have a, a, a low impedance fault where the say the line and neutral are shorted together, we need to make sure that the energy let through um, that comes through the protective device, um, you know, it doesn't damage the cable. So under fault conditions, the time in which it takes the protective device to operate is known as the pre arcing time. 
And after the cutoff point is reached, the arc begins to extinguish. But during the pre arc in time, the electrical energy is passed through into the conductors. OK, this is known as the pre arc in let through energy. So in the regs, 43452 requires that fault currents of short durations in any point of the circuit is interrupted before the permitted limited temperature of any conductor or cables exceeded. OK, and for our standard devices there, the 60898s and the 61009s, um, it can be checked by ensuring that the withstand energy of the cable, which is the K squared S squared, is greater than the let through energy of the protected device, which is the I squared T squared. OK, so you can start looking at that adiabatic equation and rearranging things and getting those values and checking that that is met. OK. Now, the maximum time in seconds um, in which live conductors reach their limit in temperature um, as an approximation can be calculated from this formula. OK, so we use T because it's the value of T, but the, the T sometimes has a different meaning because sometimes we may be talking about T in the Adovac equation as being the um, time in which the device operates. In this equation, we're looking at T being the maximum time in which the cables get to their limits okay and when you're doing your design step by step you're going to get all of this information so we just talked about calculating the um, short circuit current and you know what your levels of k is you're going to look at how the cable is grouped and bunched and what the material is um, to get your k value from the tables in 54 point whatever it is and then you'll know your sizes because you know what uh, your sizes of your conductors are at this point. OK. Moving on. If you rearrange the formula like this, you're looking that I squared T OK is less than K squared S squared. OK, so it looks quite daunting. And, uh, you know, if you're not familiar with cable calcs, you'll probably be thinking, wow, am I supposed to do all of that? And the easy answer to that is yes, under certain conditions. We all know that standard domestic um, calculations have been done in some publications over the years. Standard circuits in small situations may be acceptable and experienced contractors know them, so they know that I use this cable size on that and there's not too many checks. But if you get asked to supply a workshop down the bottom of a long garden or a, or a stable block or something like that, straight away you've got to go through this whole process and this is what we're we're talking about, OK? And for energy let through, you can use manufacturer's data. So let's get an example of how that works up on the screen. Again, this is all covered in the publication. So we're looking at the energy withstand of the cable, which is the K squared S squared. OK, it's the thermal capacity of the cable. And what we've got here is the designer. He's looking at um, a commercial installation where they're using a four mil twin and a half um, up on trays to feed these type of fittings, which are going to use 0.75 flexes for the light. They're LED fittings, they don't need a, a very demanding size, but the installer or the designer rather, he wants to ensure that these lengths of cable under fault conditions um, are able to withstand the energy, okay? So from that, he takes out his um, value of K for his bunched copper cable or whatever that stands for. It, um, 115 is, is quite a common one because we use bunched cables and, and copper in, in, in typically. And he's took the cable that he's checking here uh, as this size and it gives him 7,439 amps per square second, right? Go to the manufacturer's data. Look at the prospective fault current. This is the calculated prospective fault current, which I explained earlier. So similar to the um, R1, R2, you can do your resistance of your line and your resistance of your neutral, OK, to get that resistance. And then you can work out your fault current. you got a 1500 fault current. You put it on your manufacturer's data chart. And this is the energy let through here, this here. So the more, um, the more fault current we have, the more let through energy comes through the device into the conductor. So at 1500 amps, uh, 1500 amps, yeah, 1.5 Ka up, plot it across. And there's little lines on here, They're pretty hard to see on the screen actually, but 
that there is four ka squared per second of energy let through so we know that we're okay because our calculation showed us that the cable can handle 7439 and we've only got four so that's job done okay so a little bit about the exam now um i've got my project here somewhere this is kind of what it amounts to um i can't see my picture so i'm hoping that um it's coming through to you okay i'm not going to show you any great detail but to show you what a, a calculation process that we've just discussed me and richard have just gone through i'm just going to pull one at random here okay one of our um senior lecturers was kind enough to give me this on the course actually it was a little sheet to work through so you put in all your circuit details and you go through your design ib what what um what factors you're going to apply and then you start to calculate the cable size okay and then you're looking at your voltage drop and you can and you can put all those figures down there then on the other side you work out all your short circuit conditions all that um k squared s squared stuff to check that you've complied then you come over to here and you work out what your um short circuit and fault currents are you do your radio back equations and then from the whole sheet you can calculate what uh cable size is required and for the project that i done there was um, possibly 50 or 60 of those to do okay and then in the project worth you're pointing out here paul worth pointing out that if you work your way through that long hand uh, it's generally 45 minutes to an hour to do a calculation from scratch along long hand like that uh, and, and that's not an exaggeration well, to get to the end of it and think oh, i've got to look the same cable size and start again this is the purpose of the project um the project steps it down to go through all the areas of design so you'll put all your choices and justifications in and you'll be telling the um instructor just how to do it um you've got your scale drawings in there which i'm not going to show you because they're sitting guilds all your all of your wiring systems you're going to use and by the time you've done your project you've got up to two years to do it it makes you very competent in going through this process now some of you may be well competent to do it but i can remember from my days of contracting there's many contractors that just go in the wholesaler and they go oh i need that load i'll oh, give me a 10 mil and um some clips and and really and truthfully this going from a level three to a level four is what takes you to that next level when it comes to design you need to have very very good knowledge of testing and inspection which you all have anyway because you've all set a level three qualification okay so when you look at the um the whole thing is a process so the design folders like that i've seen thicker ones i had to do mine just in what i could do to get it done in the time and um, the best way to approach it is my tip and is and, and is certainly please the examiners that marked it is each of the tasks will be given a number label each section because if you just dive in and start putting all the information in they never find it so if you get a task um i've got task uh, b2 here and b2 is luminaires reason for choice so there would have been a task b2 it would have said list all your luminaires and your reason for choice so you label it up the examiner can go for it and straight away i've got perimeter lighting all the details four court pumps and canopy lighting assumptions and that's where you list it all down so it's a really good thing to to get involved in i will warn you though the written exam is a monster if you've ever taken a 2391 written exam which many of you guys will you may have done equivalents but back in the day i can remember thinking you know just how involved the 2391 level three was this is like that but on steroids it's 10 questions um and then they're broken down into bits you get you're allowed to use your regs book but you get marked badly if you copy from the regs book so you've got to learn how to take information and how to um project it in your own words um i think at least two of the questions are cable calculations so my tip would be when you go on a course um reject the exam if they offer it to you straight away reject that 
um, unless you want to take it as a warm up, reject it because you can do that. Get on with your project. And then once you've got your teeth into your project, take the exam. And then when you get those cable calculations, you'll get two questions. Remember, it's three hours, 10 questions. As uh, doing the maths, it's probably about 18 minutes or so per a question. It sounds like a long time, but they're big old questions. So when you get those cable calc um, questions, you'll be straight to the tables because you would have just learned the process. So when it says, You've got a stately home in your design. They put all this stuff in there to sort of blow your mind and you're going to design this, this and this. The ambient temperatures that the cable's going to be underground between here and here. Straight away, you've got to be knowing those formulas. Ambient temperature, CA, right, where's that table? Boom, boom. So my tip is to get into the project so that you um, so that you are up to speed with that. And for the remainder of the questions, it's about the whole process. So what we talked about right at the beginning, if you're asked to design something, go for all of those risks at the beginning, go for all of those characteristics, what type of people are on there, what's the mechanical protection, what's the IP ratings that are needed, what types of RCDs, and explain it to the examiner. I'm on a caravan pitch. We're likely to use a TT because, you know, PME is, forbidding you've not copied the regs but you've told him why you've chose tt um we're going to use we've got to meet selectivity so i'm going to use 300 uh, 300 milliamp here i'm going to use 100 milliamp here to get my three to one selectivity which is required by the regs but because there's socket outlets i need additional protection you use these words additional protection fault protection fire protection you talk the language and then straight away um, you've got a really good chance and um, that would be my top tip. So if you're interested, get in touch. NAPIT training do um, cover the design courses. I believe we might have a short course, but the full level four course, it is a monster and you need time to do it, but it will take you to that next level, which may open opportunities for you. OK, so moving on. I know I talk about this every week, but what we're doing on these webinars is we're giving you an insight to what we've put in the publications. And this is a publication that I actually authored myself and I was very keen to get the design process right. So everything we've covered is in detail in section four of this guide. So if you've got one of these, you can refer to the stuff that I'm talking about and have a closer look at it. And if you haven't got one it might, and you're interested in design, um, please have a look. Um, it could be it could be interest. Um, we've got the digital ones available, but I leave, believe we are starting to post things out. Oh, is that the case now, Rich? I think we're posting out now, aren't we? We've got people in the head office now. Yeah, we're back to we're posting documents out now, so yeah, everything's back up and running. So uh, the new PRS book is uh, going out, which gives uh, inspection and test guidance in the private rented sector. Code breakers, um, can't print enough, they're going out the door. Uh, we've got on-site solutions and um, we've got another one that will be coming out again shortly. So yeah, flowing out. Great stuff, great stuff. Okay, the, that, that's from the editor himself. So um, great stuff. 